Good morning, everybody, and welcome again to Monday Morning Mocha. I'm your host, Dr. Gregory Todd, and today I'm joined by the Director of Human Services and Organization Development, the amazing and comparable Sarah Morgan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, so before we get started, um, I know you and I talked a little bit about your farm. So um, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, so I have recently started a farm, a small farm called Moonrise Farm up in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Nice. And we will be growing regeneratively, uh, you know, farm fresh veggies, fruits, flowers, and we'll have some honeybees, chickens. Nice egg layers and meat, and uh, we'll be making some farm products as well. Nice. This is part of a real commitment that I have to environmental justice mm -hmm. and increasing food access in Western Mass. So it's really exciting to have the opportunity to be the stewards of this land and really support food justice in I the area. That. I love that. So I know we also talked a little bit about, you know, how you're planning to give back to the community from that perspective. Have you thought a little bit more about that or? Yeah, so we're excited to partner with some of the local food pantries. Nice. Uh, we work with my friend, Laura Fisher, who's mm -hmm. the executive director over at Just Roots. There's a potential, nice. you know, depending on if we've got excess and surplus for the farmers markets out in Greenfield to mm -hmm. support the SNAP programs out there, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. to give to Just Roots and allow for them to support community supported agriculture through their CSA model and Love potentially that. find some drop off locations in yeah. Springfield and Holyoke as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, before we move on, just let us know um, from a MOCA's perspective, how we can assist and, yes. help and partner and all that stuff. I that sounds that. super exciting. Yeah. Um, so you're the director of HR and human develop organizational development. Yes. So tell me a little bit about that and what yeah. you do. Yeah, absolutely. So as the Director of Human Resources and Organizational Development for Health New England, I oversee all of talent acquisition, hiring, onboarding, uh, compensation, people analytics, engagement, mm. compensation. I think I said that already. There's a lot that I oversee and uh, as well as payroll benefits and the full offboarding program. So the full shebang in terms of the HR functions for Health New England uh, more so than that, I think really my goal with my role mm -hmm. is to ensure that everyone who works for Health New England is having a really aligned experience with uh, with our mission, our vision, our values. We're a mission-centered nonprofit health plan that mm -hmm. operates in Western Massachusetts. We serve all four counties of Western Mass mm -hmm. and um, and Worcester County. And our mission is to help improve the lives and of the people in our communities, the health and lives of the people in our communities. We're owned by Bay State Health. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to look at the employee experience yeah. in a way that's aligned with our member experience and our um, our providers experience as well. So Sorry. it's there's a lot that I oversee. I work really closely with our DEIB yeah. committee as yeah. well as our um, health equity committee. Yeah. So speaking of DEIB, I know that um, we have talked a lot about that. What do you see as the biggest challenges right now in, in that area? Yeah, well, from an organizational standpoint, I think Health New England is in its real infancy in mm -hmm. terms of our DEIB commitment. Mm -hmm. DEIB, for those who don't know, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. A lot of organizations will define that differently, but mm -hmm. at Health New England, we're looking to really embed diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging into all aspects of our mission, vision, operations. Um, at Health New England, you know, we're in the middle of our five-year plan. We kicked yeah. off our DEIB committee in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. Yeah, yeah. And we started a five-year plan. We're in the middle of that. So we're really trying to reassess, okay, how far have we come so far? Where do we still have left to go? Yeah, yeah. I think nationally we're in a really interesting political moment for DEI for DEI overall yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of challenges to DEI efforts across the country in mm -hmm. particular in a lot of these more conservative areas like you know Florida Texas mm -hmm. where the governor and political you know folks over there have have started to 
think about ways to ban DEI. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it started in 2016 with, with President Trump and mm -hmm. uh, the policies that he put in place there. And, you know, I think there were a lot of different things that happened during that time that mm -hmm. laid the groundwork for where we stand today in terms of seeing uh, books being banned in schools. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of challenges to trans and non-binary folks' health care. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing critical race theory as mm -hmm. a discipline and a practice in schools and universities being banned. So I think we're in this moment right now as DEI professionals where we're thinking about where we see the future going. How do we continue to you know, increase the work that we're doing to really, Im Im you know, make the impacts that we're looking for in terms of DEI across the country, yeah. notwithstanding the fact that we in Western Mass aren't seeing those same, you know, things happening here. Absolutely. So one of the things that I've kind of run into is this idea um, that people, like say staff members, for example, may be disenfranchised with DEIB because of the perceived stigma of the verbiage, the mechanisms, those types of things having to do with DEIB, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so wondering if it's possible to still reap the benefits of DEIB, mm -hmm. um, but almost repackage it, mm. right? As a, as a model, an impactful model for, for staff. What do you think? Yeah. You know, I think it's a great question. I think that the buzzwords for sure turn a lot of people off. We mm -hmm. talk about privilege mm -hmm. when we talk about unconscious bias. We talk about how people are, you know, beneficiaries of privilege, mm -hmm. depending on their various identities. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about the dimensions of diversity, we think about race, age, class, gender, sexual mm -hmm. orientation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't like to think about the privilege that they may or may not have because yeah. they're, uh, they don't always see that in their lives. That's yeah. part of it. Right. So I think part of this is education. Yeah. We've got to make sure people understand that talking about privilege isn't a value judgment. It's right. not, right. you know, I identify as a white cisgender right. queer person right. that that means that I carry a lot of privilege mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, but it's not a value judgment when I talk about privilege. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. I think it's educating about what it means to be the recipients of legacy historical opportunities that have been handed mm -hmm. fairly or unfairly, mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of the time unfairly mm -hmm. to people who carry this privilege. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about unconscious bias, when we talk about the ways that we carry as individuals all of these beliefs in our in our minds and our socialization, we're trying to unpack that. Can we do that in a way that feels safe for people? Right. And it's not always going to feel safe for people. I think that's part of the, the problem. We, we talk about safe spaces. Mm -hmm. DEI is not a safe space. Yeah. It's a safer yeah. space. It's a brave space. Um, we want people to feel like they can be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. I think reaping the benefits of DEI B to your point is how can we as DEI professionals call people into the conversation to help mm -hmm. understand how we are all part of a system. Right. We're all part of a system that is operating with individual interpersonal dynamics yeah. that are often the result of coded and ingrained beliefs and behaviors that we carry with us all the time. Yeah. And so DEI professionals have to be able to help people see what's maybe unseen yeah. so that we can work together as individuals and, and really help make that impact. Totally agree. Super hundred percent agree. Um, and as you were talking, I was thinking about, do we have, is it possible to create a safe space, but still recognize that it's going to be an uncomfortable space, mm -hmm. right? Because I think sometimes people feel that safe is synonymous with non-exploration or non-growth or whatever the case is. And I think in this instance, DIB has to be uncomfortable in order to explore it, right? Absolutely. Um, so I think that kind of leads to my next thought. Is it possible to explore DIB in its entirety, like ageism, sexism, 
educational differences, cultural differences, those types of things without getting always, and I'm going to say always as my bias, <laughs> hung up on this idea of race, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to comfortably and effectively explore these ideas without being in a group, for example, and the group totally being consumed by racial inequalities when there are so many other inequalities that exist yeah. between. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. I think that it's hard because at the end of the day, when you account for all the control data, yeah. right? A lot of the times the negative outcomes that you see with respect to health, with respect to criminal justice, with respect to um, media representation, mm. all of the sort of ways in which we see identity play out, mm -hmm. when you account for all other dimensions of diversity, what you find is that race is typically at the heart of these disparate outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we talk about, for example, black maternal health, that's mm -hmm. a, a real goal and focus for Massachusetts in terms of the health equity work that's being done statewide. Mm -hmm. When you piece that apart, you're looking at gender and you're looking at race, mm -hmm. but it's not only gender that is the issue mm -hmm. with that. It's when you see that intersectionality of race and gender. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we piece those things apart, you have to talk about race mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because race will always, when race is always present, right? Mm -hmm, I think that's mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. to just important to name, mm -hmm. whether you're white, black, mm -hmm, Asian, mm -hmm, Latino, mm -hmm. race is always present. And I think it tends to, people tend to assume that if it's a room full of white people, that race isn't present, right. but it is. Right, right. And it's heavily influencing that space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's important that DEI professionals and DEI work name that that is present in that space at all yeah. times. And that influences the conversation. That's a great point. It is important that we think about and focus on the other dimensions of diversity as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. those things, you know, those other dimensions, age, class, that, you know, that is also embedded into the outcomes that people have in terms of their experiences within the criminal justice system, yeah. all the institutions. Yeah. And so I don't think it's possible personally mm -hmm. to not name race in a space. Right. But I think it is, there is a way to focus on sexism, ageism, right. classism, um, and how that impacts people's experiences in their day-to-day -day lives. When you're talking about ability, for example, mm -hmm. I like to say I'm, temporarily able-bodied right, because right. I think it's important to name that although right now everything's you know working for me according to plan but that's a privilege that I have right. in this moment and it's a great point we need to be thinking about there's this concept called trickle up mm -hmm. uh, social justice mm -hmm. and it's a concept that was coined by Dean Spade and attorney Dean Spade and he does some excellent work around social justice and in particular class and racial uh, justice mm -hmm. and he framed this as if you always account for the most marginalized in any community, you will be in essence sort of trickling up through all other identities. So I think it's a way to really think about um, if we're ensuring that, for example, when you talk about disability, mm -hmm. you're creating this universal design that everyone can access. You've got closed captioning on, you've got accessible you know, ramps and walkways that will always support the people who have more privilege mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you look at the example of curb cuts, for example, mm -hmm. that was there to support wheelchair mm -hmm. users mm -hmm. in a, in a mm -hmm. street, but mm -hmm. it supports uh, those with walking with strollers or other limited mobility as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to really be talking about all dimensions of diversity. I won't take credit for that. That's Kimberly Crenshaw who coined yeah. the topic of intersectionality. And I think that's a way to really make people have buy-in because mm -hmm. you can see yourself in that. Mm -hmm. You can see yourself on that wheel of privilege where you're starting from, you know, the, the positions that hold more power mm -hmm. within a given identity and you work your way outward and you can plot your, your own experience because that all codes into how you experience the world and how mm -hmm. you go about the world is according to your own intersectional identity. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Um, I think one of 
my observations with DIB and DIB training has been, you know, that that people come in to an experience, like you said, with their own bias, right? Based on experience. I guess my question is how do we, or is it possible to address those biases beforehand so that uh, the training is that much more effective, right? Because again, in, in my experience of my observation is, is that sometimes the training is half spent addressing those things, right? Before the actual work is done uh, moving forward. So, so is it possible? Like, is it, is it something that needs to be thrown into a DIB model where, where we are exploring con- unconscious bias, implicit bias as a foregoing conclusion that this is part of the pl- process instead of making the assumption? Yeah, y- you know, how much time? How much time? How much time do you have for this training, <laughs> Go ahead. right? Go ahead. Um, I think there's strategies for sure to give people an opportunity to explore their own biases, their own socialization, uh, the way that they believe, uh, you know, about the things that they believe about themselves, I would say, before they get into that space and do the training. Because you're right. I think a lot of trainings are going to be effective, most effective, Mm -hmm. if you've gone through and done a little bit of that Mm pre-work to understand who you are and your own positionality in the space. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the best trainings that I've gone through are two day workshops Mm -hmm. where you're building trust, you're building vulnerability so that you can push yourself. You had mentioned that, that model of growth that, Mm -hmm. you know, DEI trainings are going to be uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. We've got to be able to face that discomfort. And if you're not, then you're staying stuck in that comfort zone. Absolutely. We want to push people into the learning zone. We want to push people into a space where they're questioning their beliefs. They're questioning those underlying assumptions that they've had about the world that often they've had since they were children. Yeah. These are early socialization, right? Moments where, you know, this is what their parents taught them. This is what their church taught them. This is what their schools and their early educators taught them. You want to push them into that space where they're challenging those really deeply ingrained beliefs. And that's uncomfortable. You don't want to push people so far that they're getting into that panic zone Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. that's going to be unproductive. They're going to shut down and people have different thresholds for where that panic zone Mm -hmm. lives. So, you know, going back to the trainings, the best trainings that, like I said, have that I've been to are those kind of structured in this way of a social justice Mm intergroup dialogue mm -hmm, type mm -hmm, facilitation mm -hmm. where you're putting people in a space where they're going to be pushing each other. Uh, You know, you have to build trust in order to be able to do that. So if you and I, Dr. Todd, are going to sit down and build trust with one another, Mm -hmm. I'm going to really be respecting your story, listening to you and, and what you bring to the table. And when I hear something that you've been through, now I respect you. Now I'm sort of in that space with you and I'm I'm invested in you and your outcomes. If you share with me a story or an experience that you've had, that's, you know, really disrupts my own understanding of my own experience, Mm -hmm. then you're pushing me into that zone. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's not to say that the learning needs to happen on the back of the most marginalized individual in that space. No, it's building that shared trust within the training. So I don't know if that can always happen in pre-work. Because you've got people sitting in a vacuum reading an article or watching a video, for example, that works for some people. But I think the most growth tends to come from that really building a shared connection with your facilitators and with your other, you know, your other participants. And and I think that can happen in a shorter training, but I think it's less likely that it'll have that long term impact that you're looking for. Absolutely. So. Something a little bit more controversial. Why do you think, and again, my experience, my observation, why do you think that most leaders miss that? Mm. You know, why do you think that DEI is often pushed as a box that we have to tick organizationally versus an investment in our staff? Well, I think it comes down to intentions. Mm -hmm. Why 
did a leader feel? Why did the organizational leaders feel like they needed to engage in this DEI effort to begin begin with? Yeah. Right. And for some, it is a tick the box exercise. For some, it is, you know, we've got this affirmative action reporting Mm. that we have to Mm. do. It's showing that we don't have enough folks, you know, of different identities within a certain segment of our population. We have to address that. And so they don't know how to get out of their own way. Yeah. Because all they know is to do just the same thing that they've been doing. So they bring in a DEI consultant Mm. who often is there really to tick the box, Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. is probably going to pick up on, Mm. you know, the root causes. And and sometimes leaders aren't always willing to Mm -hmm. to face that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it does come down to why did we initially have this person in the first place? Yeah. Um, but I think there's still room to bring buy-in yeah. into that moment where a DEI professional is kind of confronting that. Um, I think leaders miss it because, because it's challenging their status quo, yeah. right? And, yeah. and if they don't always understand the business, there's a lot of <laughs> talk about the business case for DEI. Yeah. I think there is a case to be made for DEI. I think there's an important reason why we uh, why we do DEI is to really truly impact the business and how we're trying to make business outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it, I think it comes down to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stumped on this one because every organ, it's going to be a case by case. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and the reasons why people don't always want to get pushed out of their comfort zones is going to come down to a case by case, but often it's because they're not, being pushed in a way that feels comfortable for them or Absolutely. safe for them. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. love that answer. Um, so if, if you could, based on your experience, give advice to any leader about moving forward with DEI, moving forward with a, an impactful DEI model, what would you say? Like, what would you tell them? Necessary, like this is important. Yeah, I would say really think about why, why your business exists. Yeah. I think if you've got to start with your why for being in business, because for example, if you're a healthcare organization, your mission is to help improve the health and lives of the people in your communities, for example, start with health new England's. How can you truly do that? If you aren't considering all of the ways in which your members might have Mm. negative outcomes. Mm. I, my tagline with DEI is, kind of the work in the workplace. Mm-hmm. I always want to be thinking about what's our ultimate goal of how we be in business. Because no matter what, at the end of the day, having healthy, happy, engaged employees is always going to impact that mission of your organization. If you have employees who feel like they can bring their best selves into the workplace every day and uh, are supported in doing that, they're receiving equitable pay, they're Mm -hmm. receiving equitable treatment by the organization, they're receiving the tools and the resources that they need to do their best work and be their best selves, then they're going to show up happier and more engaged in the mission. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. means that you've got to have equitable paid time off, for example. Mm -hmm. That means Mm -hmm. you've got to have equitable policies around childcare and Mm -hmm. flexible work options. Mm -hmm. And that benefits everybody, but Mm -hmm. in particular, it's going to benefit the folks who the workplace really wasn't designed for in the beginning. And so folks with young families, young, you know, young parents, uh, folks who have mobility issues, transportation issues. Again, it comes back to that concept of that universal design. Your workplace is only going to be a functioning, efficient, effective workplace for that mission. If you're making sure that everybody can do their best work Mm. and it comes down to equity because if you, you've seen that meme, I'm sure we all have, right, of the folks who are standing in front mm-hmm, of the fence mm-hmm, and they're trying to watch mm-hmm. the baseball game. Absolutely, yeah. If you're giving the same size box to everyone to see over that fence, then that only benefits the people who are tall enough to begin with. Yeah. But if you take the size box that everybody needs, then they can all see over the fence. And if you take the box away, I'll take, or the fence away altogether, that's justice. Yeah. So I think we all should be aiming to take that fence down. But in the meantime, let's make sure everybody has the right box that they need mm. to stand up and actually do the job accordingly. There are laws to protect employees, right? At mm-hmm. the bottom line, if all you're looking for is let's just stay in compliance, there are laws to protect against discrimination and make sure that everybody 
is being given accommodations if they've got disabilities. So at the end of the day, there's a legal and compliance and I'm an attorney, so I'm always mm-hmm. going to make sure that mm-hmm. employers mm-hmm. understand that um, as much as it's the right thing to do, it's also the law. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so you've got to be working to make sure that you're having equitable and you know non-discriminatory policies and practices. But the business case for DEI, the advice that I have is really think about your why for being in business. And that should that why should be the exact same as why DEI is important for your Absolutely. organization. I love that. Um, I think that's an amazing way to end our segment. You are fantastic. We went totally off script today <laughs> and you're a fantastic rock star. Thank you so much for joining me. And I would love to have you on again Thanks, whenever Andrew. you're available. I'd Thanks. love to be back. Yeah, Absolutely. Anytime. Well, until next time, everybody, thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.